ladies, I'm Dana Matnock and I'm on the writing and research team here at CFC um, as part of the women's ministry. I'm super excited to be teaching this week and to get to dive in uh, further to First John with you. Um, thanks for meeting us here online. If this is where you're uh, coming to hear this study, we're really happy that you're joining us in this way. So I wanted to get started right away here, but I wanted to mention first that a lot of times in the Bible, I know Mandy always mentions this, that we can't just jump in and start off with verses randomly and take them out of context, right? We have to know what happens before and after in the story. And especially with this portion of scripture in 1 John, things can look a little tricky if we just kind of do that and kind of just open up and point and read what it says. Sometimes verses can be taken as frightening or misunderstood, you can misunderstand them. And instead, John is really actually meaning for them to be comforting and encouraging. So we want to have kind of preface that, that it's really important to read the whole chapter or the whole book or the books before and after um, when you're diving into a, a section of scripture. Our section today um, is just 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 14. So we are just going to squeeze in that little bit of, um, of words there. So we are going to start with the fact that these um, what Mandy talked about before um, this portion is that John had just finished telling us that we are completely and eternally forgiven by what Christ has done for us, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that we know that, we can go into the next part knowing, just like the heading says, that Christ is our advocate. He is our supporter. He publicly supports us. That's what an advocate is. And um, we know these truths and we know that we are forgiven so that we can now move into the second portion and see what he asks of us. So I'm going to start by reading verses 3 through 6. And it says, And by this we know that we have come to know him. And if we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this may, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So we see there that um, the first part in verse 3 says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. The next part, which can be a little bit um, kind of hard to understand or seem threatening, says, Whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. And I think if that's the only portion of scripture that you read, you're thinking, well, that seems a little threatening or a little judgmental. But let's move on to see what that means. So the, the word know can have two meanings, K-N-O-W. The first meaning is to be aware of something through observation, inquiry, and information. The second meaning is to have developed a relationship with someone through meeting them or spending intimate time with them. So if you look back at verse 3, we know right, through observation and information and inquiry, that we have come to know him through a, gaining a relationship with him, through meeting him and spending time with him and growing in that intimacy with him. That if we, that if we keep, or if we do those things, we should keep his commands, okay? In Greek, the word to know is genosko, and it implies a very vivid understanding or a deep relationship between what is known and the knower. So those words, I was really just, I was like, you kept saying no, and no, it's like a tongue twister almost in that portion of scripture. Because you're like, if you know, then you know, then you don't know, and if you do know, okay? And so I was trying to break that down a little bit because I'm like, how do I actually um, really describe this to somebody who's never heard this portion of scripture and feels like they're being called a liar based on their actions? Well, this comes from spiritual maturity, right? If you are spending time with the Lord and have an intimate relationship with him or declare that you have confessed your sins to him and that he is your Lord and, um, you know, we, you follow him, believe he died on the cross, right? And in that, that word that Mandy went over last week, he is the propitiation for our sins. Then you are claiming to know him, which means if you do not walk in his ways and follow his commands, then really the truth is not in him, in you, okay? And many times people have this like superior knowledge of things, but they are actually preaching false doctrine because they feel like they have this knowing, but that they can sort of make up their own meaning with it. And other times people are so based, like their, their relationship is so based on their feelings or what they get and they base what they know on how they feel 
that we can end up in a difficult place there too. So it's really about finding our way between those two things, right? We have the knowledge and we have the relationship. We get the knowledge through the Bible, gaining that intimacy with him through talking with him and spending time with him. And that is how we gain that relationship with him. So in that, in verse four, where he says, if the truth is not in you, um, if you're not walking in the truth or if following his commands, you're a liar, right? That part is really meant you know, can seem really intimidating, but it's really not meant to be condemning to us. It's really an encouragement to believers. It's really like a line drawn in the sand. You're either keeping his commands or you're not. And in Matthew 7, 15 to 20, he goes on to tell us how we can recognize false teachers or how we can recognize if we ourselves are um, portraying um, characteristics of a false teacher. And in verse 15, it starts saying, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So here we are saying that obedience and our being and our following the Lord's commands will produce good fruit in us, right? So if we're doing those things, it becomes you know, visible and apparent to those around us that our obedience um, is the proof of our love of God, right? When we obey and bear those fruits, that's the proof for the world to see that our, we deeply love God the Lord and want to walk in his ways. That consistent obedience produces that evidence um, that our relationship with God is real and that we value it and that we spend time with him to know which way to walk. So when we see these trees or people or, you know, things that are happening around us that are bearing bad fruit, that's evidence, right, that there is a false teaching or there is um, something that is not happening in a way that's obedient to the Lord or following his commands. So when we put our faith in Jesus and what he's accomplished on the cross, and we believe he died and that he rose again, um, we have this spiritual birth, right? And we become a new creation. We become his sheep, the sheep of his pasture, and that enables us to follow him and gives us that deep desire. So we obey for three different reasons, okay? We either want to, we want to obey, we need to, okay, because of the outcomes, um, or, we, or we have to, we need to, or we want to. And the want to part comes from this deep desire, right? The have to and the need to, it's like, okay, I know what the end result of this is going to be, and if I don't, X, Y, Z is going to happen. And we can try to kind of plan that out in man's ways of trying to decide our next steps. But the want to is this natural progression that sort of flows out of us for our desire, desire and our longing to want to, to obey. And that pursuit really comes from pursuing that intimate relationship with the Lord. Those are sort of a natural progression of things that happen together. So sincere faith changes the way we live. We will not look the same as we used to look prior to us committing our lives to the Lord, prior to becoming a new creation. Okay, so, you know, a lot of times you think that people can't tell, right, that you're not pursuing a relationship with the Lord or you can talk the talk but not really live it out, right? We can come up with this Christianese that sort of sounds um, right and correct and think we can fool the people around us. And maybe we can, but we can't fool the Lord, right? He knows the innermost parts of our heart and our desires and um, in the truth of what our desire is to obey him. But looking at all of this is not a call to perfection. He's not saying, be perfect in every way in order to prove that you believe in me. He's saying that we are not immune to sin, okay? All believers are not immune to sin. Nobody's immune to it, okay? We are all sinners. We are imperfect people. Um, in Romans 8, it tells us that a person who is not born of God's spirit does not submit to God's law. So that's a different um, sort of standard that people are held to. If you have confessed to the Lord, right, and you are, you are saying that you are following in his ways, um, uh, that person is born of God's spirit and is a new nature. If you have not done that, then you cannot submit to God's law um, because you don't have that same um, responsibility. 
So we really need to assess whether the true change has taken place in our lives um, and if we've really allowed to do the, uh, the Lord to do a new work in us. I think a lot of times, even if you've been a believer for a long time, we tend to put up a wall and just think um, we can do it on our own. And I know, I feel like I'm sort of coming out of a little stint of a season. Um, my default is I can do it myself and I'm in control and things are good and I got this. That is like Dana's default. And all of a sudden, there will be these moments where I'm like, what am I doing, right? It's not like, um, you know, there's definitely mountaintops and valleys in life. And sometimes we don't cling to the Lord as much in the mountaintop as we do in the valley, right? But I'm talking just normal standard life. Um, and a lot of us are walking through it and we're not considering the fact that we shouldn't be walking through it on our own. Um, the importance of pursuing the Lord in all of those seasons and not just going after whatever our flesh desires and only reaching out and banking on that relationship and pursuing that relationship when we're um, you know, having some of our greatest struggles in our lives. Um, that's not the way to go. And Satan knows this is a weakness, right? He knows us and he knows where we can, he can sneak in and kind of be like, okay, I know that I can derail Dana here because she thinks she's in control. But then when I quickly circle back around and realize I cannot do this on my own, right? I can't do ministry, motherhood, uh, marriage, anything like that. Is that like the three M's maybe? I can't do any of those things on my own um, without him. And so I get on this, then my, this cycle sort of goes to this shame and guilt that Satan is also then, well, okay, she's thinking she is going to get herself on back on track, but now I'm going to really make her feel really shameful and guilty about getting off track. Okay. And then I'm like, I shouldn't be here again, right? How does this happen? And it's this desire for perfection, okay? But at the end there, it says in verse 5, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. So this is not that we become perfect, right? This is that the God's love is perfected in us, okay? And that is a gift of grace towards us. It's that he loves us, and that is a perfect love that can't be cast out. And so it doesn't mean that we become perfect, but it does mean it changes us. And it does mean it gives us that ability to redirect, okay, to leave our fleshly desires behind and follow, you know, back to the Lord. And it manifests itself in our lives that makes us different people. We can pivot, okay? We can gather ourselves up and get, you know, back to, you know, pursuing that intimate relationship with the Lord. So if we go to the next part, section, or verse 7, the next section says the new commandment. And it says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard, okay? And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So over 60 years prior to John writing this letter, Jesus was speaking to his disciples in the book of John, and he said, this command I give to you to love one another as I have loved you. And prior to that, he was teaching about loving others as ourselves. So he's kind of circling back, John's circling back to this teaching, saying this isn't a new commandment that you've heard, okay? This is an old commandment, but I'm saying it again. I'm reiterating because I feel like you need to hear it again, which is so true for us, right? Just keep saying it again because we are so quickly to, so quick to forget. Um, but he's saying that, you know, loving others of ourselves, you're forgetting because it can feel impossible sometimes. It can feel impossible to be the light and to let the Lord's light shine out of us and not just start taking place in the darkness or taking part in the darkness that is happening and swirling around us. Um, some of the parts that I kind of get, um, kind of like stumble on here because I wasn't quite understanding, which I dug deeper and I, I really liked learning about this part was um, the darkness is passing away and the true light is always already shining. Now this was written how long ago and it's saying the darkness is passing away and I was like okay if the darkness is passing away then we're, we're not going in the right direction because it definitely still feels like our world is full of darkness. Um, but as I was digging in a little bit this is kind of talking about time not so much evil right the world is a dark place okay and it's not gotten any better. Things seem to you know all the time you're looking around and you're like, wow, the world is just evil at times, okay? And this is really in, in regards to the fact that Satan is the darkness, right? And we are living in this darkness, but the one true light is Jesus. And every day that passes is 
a dark day that is behind us, and we are one step closer to living in eternity in the light with Jesus. So every day, um, you know, the darkness is passing away. Satan already, or the Lord already defeated Satan. Jesus died on the cross. He was defeated. Victory is the Lord's, okay? So we know that that is a promise that we can stand on. So we ha can visualize that the darkness is passing away and we are headed towards the light if we have a relationship with the Lord. And it's important, too, to hone in on what comes after that. Verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness, okay? So now this is kind of going back to relationship and um, what that looks like. Um, in, in regards to light and dark. If you say you love the Lord, then you are in the light, okay? But if you are out of fellowship with a brother or sister in Christ, then that's you in the darkness. That's you being part of, um, you know, kind of shaming and guilting and condemning people that might not be walking with the Lord who, or who are walking with the Lord but are maybe in um, a rough season, okay? We have to be careful as Christians that we're not taking part in that, um, that we are... You know the song, we, they will know we are Christians by our love, right? And sometimes you're like, okay, love, everybody. But that doesn't mean we're just like okaying everything happening in the darkness. But that does mean that we are encouraging our fellow believers, that we are in fellowship with one another. If you are out of fellowship with another believer, it is going to make it very difficult for you to be in fellowship with the Lord. I think a lot of people think they can kind of separate the two, that my relationship with the Lord over here is happening, but my relationship with these people, they drive me nuts, and I don't believe what they're saying, and so um, I, or I am, you know, frustrated with them or angry, and I'm not going to talk to them about it. I'm just going to have this, like, rift over here. And those two worlds um, have trouble, you know, uh, coexisting, okay, because we cannot hate our brother and love the Lord or love our God, or being, um, like, communing with him, okay? Because our community matters in that sense. So hatred and acts of the, is an act of the flesh. If we are acting um, with hatred towards a brother and sister in Christ, or anyone, that is an act of the flesh. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, right? If we have Jesus inside of us, the Holy Spirit is doing a new work in us. He is producing the fruit of the Spirit. We can go through all the fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians. But that is what is pouring out of us when we are communing with the Lord. So, you know, not hating our brother is what is, is, the, is the point here, right? It's simple logic. God, love, God requires us to love others, and we are to obey his commands. Um, so therefore, like we said, if we're hating our brother, we are not loving God, okay? And John isn't so much concerned about, you know, all of this other part. Like, let's go to the, let's read the verse 10, and I'll kind of finish up there. I sh I'm jumping ahead. But whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in, in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Okay? So he's saying we need to be looking at the light. We need to be looking at our relationship with the Lord. If we are in the word and we believe what he says and we are truly trying to become a new creation and walk in the light, then the darkness cannot coexist, okay? Um, so if there's a sin that you need to confess, if there's a temptation, if there's a fleshly desire that needs confessing, um, do that. I encourage you to do that so that you can walk in the light and not have that weight of the shame and the chains holding you back um, from relationships or whatever had the Lord has for you um, in your life. So if we continue on we, in looking at verses 12 to 14 and that next part, John, he's talking about, um, he gives like a little um, little thing at the end talking about, um, he, he states like a people group. I'm writing to little children. I'm writing to you fathers. He goes on to say, I'm writing to you young men. Um, and again, children and fathers, young men. Okay. And it's kind of tricky because he's reading all these parts, um, or he's saying all these words, but you're like, okay, why does this matter for these different people groups? But really, he's not referring to, like, fathers and children. If we look a little deeper into that, he's actually referring to various stages of our spiritual growth and our spiritual maturity. So our spiritual behavior and how we um, act and obey and, you know, have that evidence of our proof um, of our love for the Lord um, depends on our spiritual maturity most times. So when we ex um, accept the Jesus into our hearts or into our lives and have make a commitment to follow him, um, we are not immediately mature Christians. A lot of people are expecting or can, you know, I feel like 
carry shame or embarrassment that they don't know how to find every book of the Bible or they don't know, you know, every verse there is. I mean, I've been saved and walking with the Lord for 30 plus years and I don't know where every verse is located in the Bible. Okay, so I feel like that is a misconception. What he's saying is we are craving growth, right? Um, we start with the spiritual milk, right? We start with the milk, like it says um, in 1 Peter. And it says that as we grow in our salvation and as we taste and see that the Lord is good and we start witnessing his faithfulness in our lives and we drink that spiritual milk, we move on from the milk to solid food. But if we're not moving from milk to solid food in that progression and our growth and our relationship with the Lord, then there is a problem with our spiritual maturity. We need to be doing that. Um, and so in Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, it's saying if you don't, move forward into needing solid food, then you will remain unskilled and lack righteousness. Um, it's the mature, the spiritually mature that can discern truth and distinguish good from evil. So I think something else that I read that kind of I related to, it's like somebody that you've spent a lot of time with, right? You start to act like them. Maybe your kids spending a lot of time with you or your um as you spending time with your parents or, you know, a grandparent or a mentor, whoever you're spending a lot of time with, you become that person. You become like them. So a lot of times we gravitate towards people that we want to become because we know spending time with them, we, like our kids, if we look at them, we're like, oh man, we, you are me. Or sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm my mom or whatever it might be. Um, we assume sort of their strengths and weaknesses. And so if you think about the Lord in that aspect that the more we abide in him, the more we align ourselves with him, the more we begin to um, allow his strengths to pour out of us, right? We allow him to build us up. And I encourage you to go to John 15 and kind of read about what it looks like to abide in the Lord and the um, fruit that comes from doing that um, back to bearing fruit. So we will see the evidence of abiding. And I can say personally in my life, when I am not abiding in the Lord, I am grouchy. I am controlling, I am, you know, a myriad of things that I don't want to be. And when I realize that this is happening and it sort of smacks me in the face, I think, wow, Lord, the thing I'm missing here is you. It's not all of the things that I'm trying to do or gain or achieve, um, thinking that that will help me bear fruit, okay? And I think that that's a really easy thing to get kind of tripped up on. So in the last part of verse 15, it says, or verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong. The word of God abides, abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So in order to overcome the evil one, we must abide in the Lord. Um, and that is truly, you know, the only way that we can, and I think abide sometimes feels like this big word and a fancy word, but abide is truly just intimate time. Are you spending time in prayer? Are you talking to him? Are you approaching him, you know, just in a way that is a friendship or but also standing in awe of him? There's so many facets to it and you can start with any of them, okay? Are you just going to the Psalms and just reading and letting those, those words just pour into you um, and encourage you? So if it feels overwhelming to start abiding, if you're feeling like I'm in a place where I feel lost and I'm not there, then I would encourage you to just get in the word and the Lord will bring you back to, to him. Reread 1 John over and over again through this, through this study and really cling to the words and the promises that he's given us because I really felt like going into 1 John, I was like, oh man, like I just, you know, I never want to say something that I don't do or believe myself or that, you know, whatever that may be, but I felt like reading through this book over and over again really gave me a sense of clarity of mission and purpose and just, you know, what as believers our calling is um, to follow him. So I hope you're encouraged by that. Again, John did not intend this to be discouraging or threatening or intimidating, but instead encouraging. Um, and again, also like a spur on to, to spur us on to reach out to those that may not um, know Christ or believe in his commands um, and to really try to go out and make disciples and give other people that opportunity to have that experience of abiding. So thanks so much for listening to this week's teaching. Um, I hope you're able to connect with somebody at church or, um, you know, maybe in a home group to kind of go through the discussion questions and reflect a little bit on the lesson. So um, thanks for being here today.